Hello folks, today we'll be talking about object pose recognition, and this will be the subject of CVAA 11.2-3. So the idea of pose estimation is that we have a known object in a scene, and we have sensor data of the scene, and we want to estimate the pose of the object. Uh, the pose is the transform from the object's known coordinate frame to the camera frame, uh, and the object has to have known geometry in that local frame. The sensor data is usually an image or also a point cloud, um, and we will talk about uh, either densely structured point clouds or unstructured point clouds. So uh, applications include AR and VR, uh, pose tracking for humans, as well as a lot of manipulation tasks. A very common thing in robotics is to use what are known as fiducials to aid in object pose recognition. These fiducials are special purpose markers that we can attach to the robot or objects or the environment to help us do pose recognition much more easily. There are many different types of fiducials, uh, including QR codes, AR tags, April tags, etc. And these are nice because they can encode not just the pose of an object, but also its identity in that two-dimensional barcode that's encoded within that square. These really strong corners, edge, and, and shape features are very easy to detect in images, and so we can quite reliably determine the corners of each of these tags using image processing techniques. Now, once we've detected the corners of these tags, we'll use the known size of the tags to be able to create a marker pose. The marker pose uh, usually has the X and the Y along the size of the, the tag, uh, and the Z is either up or down in that marker frame. So this is the unknown. We have the known local marker points, so these will just be offsets in X and Y along that local coordinate frame, uh, and we'll have the pixels. So what we'll want to do is minimize what's known as the reprojection error. We'll find this marker pose that, you know, the first thing that happens is that the world's, the local coordinates of the markers get mapped to camera coordinates through this TMC matrix. You'll then divide by the Z coordinate to do the projective transformation, and then you'll multiply by the affine intrinsic uh, transform matrix. So here the uh, reprojection error is going to be the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and summed over all of the different corner uh, part points of the uh, marker. So the error function here that we would optimize to find the pose is going to be the uh, sum of all the projection errors, sum of squares of all the projection errors. Um, these are going to be functions of the uh, marker uh, corners, the intrinsic parameters, but we'll assume that those are known, and so we're only optimizing over this rigid transform TMC. Uh, we could do so with a variety of different numerical techniques, but in any case, that will give us fairly reliable fiducial pose detection. Now, other important tasks for manipulation especially include model-based pose estimation. So if we have a model of a known object in a scene, and we have a 3D scan of the scene, what we'd like to do is figure out where the object is in uh, its from mapping from local coordinates to the camera coordinates. The difference between this and fiducial detection is that we only see one part of the object, one side of the object through the camera. Some of those parts may also be included. You know, we're, we're, uh, we may have objects blocking the other object, and so we might want to figure out from the uh, just the points describing the object in the background where it is in the scene. And so what we'd have to do is actually try to explain the data seen by the sensor by producing that estimated pose. Um, a very related topic is uh, used in 3D scanning and mapping. So in these topics, you have frames of the depth sensor. Actually, the, the depth sensor is moving from one camera frame to another. You want to estimate the transform between those two scenes. Uh, so this is very similar to object pose detection because there's a sort of reference scene and then a new scene, and we want to match the two together. In the case of 3D mapping, those are two views of the same scene. In the case of object pose detection, you have a model that you want to map to the scene. So both object pose recognition and 3D mapping uh, use what's known as a registration problem. The idea is that we have some sort of source geometry and a target geometry. 
here the geometry in pose recognition will be the known geometry of the object. The target will be the point cloud from the camera. Let's assume for now that G is a point cloud. The goal of registration is to explain what we see in the target P as a transformation of the geometry from the source to the target frame. Now, we'll, we'll look at briefly at two different types of ways to solve the registration problem. The second one, which will be a bit more useful for object pose recognition. The first one is in, <clears throat> in which the transformation between the source and the target frame are small. Um, this is a, a case in which the vast majority of the points are going to correspond between the scenes. And so we can use essentially just local methods to figure out what this transformation should be. In the case where the transformation is larger, <clears throat> then we have a significant fraction of the points which don't correspond. We may have lighting differences. Uh, we also have may have occlusions from uh, the, the different scenes. And so our post recognition actually has to be more robust to outliers. So let's look at these in turn. So the first case, which is the small transformation case, really is not too useful for object post recognition, maybe for object post tracking, um, but it, its most frequent use is in what's known as visual odometry. Uh, this is a sort of mapping uh, component in which you have uh, two camera frames, which are spaced very closely in time apart, and you can figure out the relative motion of the subsequent frames using what's known as optical flow. The idea is that if we have the next frame be the source, the current frame is the target, then to figure out the transform form of the, tar uh, the source relative to the target is basically going to give us the, the camera movement. So the idea is this, we'll take some feature points in the target, such as a corner detector, and then we'll try to, try to figure out very, so locally within a, a patch of that image, we'll try to find a corresponding feature in the next image that best matches the source. Now, the discrepancy between those two is going to denote, the, it's going to define the optical flow field. <clears throat> then we can fit a rigid transform to match the feature transforms uh, to try to match the correspondences between uh, subsequent images. Now, in the case of large transformations, which are more characteristic of object pose recognition, uh, we're going to define a metric that measures the goodness of fit between the source and the target geometries. This is going to uh, require solving what's known as a correspondence problem. We don't know exactly which point in the source matches the target. Um, and actually, we need to realize that much of the source and target geometries do not have a match. Uh, this is because you know, the scene is going to have a lot more background information. It may have occluders that are not the target object. And so we have to be very careful at rejecting outliers. Once we've defined such a metric, though, we'll then optimize this metric iteratively. We'll use local optimization techniques, uh, and we'll assume that the correspondences are fixed after determining those in the first step, and we'll just minimize the errors uh, between those correspondences. Something that I haven't spoken in much detail about is how to handle the rotation components of these transformations. And so uh, we kind of glossed over that last lecture, just glossed over it uh, when talking about the small transformation case. We'll talk a bit about it, uh, a bit about this in more detail in just a few slides. So this gives rise to what's known as the iterative closest points algorithm. It's a very common algorithm for doing all sorts of registration problems. So if the input to ICP is an initial guess, and we'll call that T. So this is going to give us an initial guessed alignment between the source and the target geometries. What we're going to do uh, is repeat until convergence, finding pairings between the point cloud and the transformed geometry according to our initial guess. We'll then drop some pairs that fail to satisfy some sort of distance criteria, and then we'll assign some sort of error metric and then locally optimize T to minimize that metric, assuming that those pairings are constant. We'll then repeat by finding new correspondences and continue. So the uh, series of frames here uh, on the bottom shows the kind of progression of this algorithm. On the left, you see that there's a closest point detection problem. So these are the closest pairs of points that are determined to be close. Uh, then an optimization is done to try to uh, minimize the distances between these uh, pairs of points. You then recalculate in the third frame the set of closest points, optimize again, and so on and so forth. And eventually with enough iterations, in this case, you should see these two objects converge so that the parts that are currently slightly misaligned will eventually become aligned. 
So there's a lot of nuances in iterative closest points algorithms, and there's actually dozens or hundreds of variants of iterative, iterative closest points algorithms out there. Uh, they differ in terms of which metric we use to find nearest neighbor pairings. They also uh, use various types of criteria to uh, reject outliers. And they also vary in terms of the method in which the metric is actually uh, used, and w which metric is used and, and how it's minimized. So one first variation is to think about what kind of metrics we'll use to decide on which points match between the source and the target geometries. Uh, obviously, we'd want to take position into account, but also surface normal is important to take into account. So for example, if we're trying to match a, a corner of a box to another corner of a box, so here's a point cloud, here's some geometry, even though the points on this side of this box are close to the top of this, uh, the, this box, the, the target box, they don't match so well in terms of their normal. And so I might actually want to match this point over here on this side over to the uh, the, the corresponding side on the other side of the geometry, so that hopefully I can converge faster to, uh, to match the two together. We also may want to use color information of our point clouds to be able to help us match. Now, why color? Well, one example uh, comes from the YCB data set that we've been playing with. Uh, there's a, uh, several types of objects that are somewhat symmetric. Um, this one is perfectly symmetric about its vertical axis. Uh, if we wanted to actually get the orientation of this thing correct, we can use the pattern on the outside to align the orientation of this object. Now, it's not super important for this particular uh, cylinder because you can grab it from any side, uh, but let's suppose that there was a hidden uh, like a handle uh, on the back side of this. Then uh, you know, if there were a handle, then we'd want to make sure that we oriented our uh, POSA estimate so that we knew where the handle was. Now, this type of problem of you know, having perceptual information that doesn't necessarily disambiguate between multiple explanations is known as perceptual aliasing. So this is a very general problem in perception in which the, the sensor data available does, is not enough to sufficiently disambiguate between nearly identical explanations of the environment. So one example of when this occurs is if you're, for example, going through, uh, let's say, multiple, uh, multiple floors of a, ho of a, of a hotel uh, building. So each of the uh, rooms on the hotel, uh, the arrangements of the floors will be almost identical, except for the numbering of the of the different rooms. And so, you know, just by looking at appearances of these hallways, it'd be very difficult to figure out which room, uh, which floor you were actually on. Another variant of different types of ICP algorithms is the ways in which matching is made fast. So uh, one thing that you would typically want to do to reduce the order of, uh, of computation, the computational complexity from order n squared down to some uh, something faster is to use some sort of nearest neighbor uh, proximity detection structures, such as grids or KD trees. Um, also, you may want to also uh, reduce the complexity of your scans so that you're only using a subsample of those scans. There are also projection-based methods that are uh, available when you're using uh, basically matching to uh, dense camera uh, scans. Uh, the idea of this is that you'll, you'll render the scene of the transformed geometry from the perspective of the point cloud, and this will help you determine matches very quickly if you use GPUs, for example. Uh, this is extremely fast if you have it on a, on a GPU, and this is what's known uh, what's used in the Connect Fusion algorithm. Um, the problem with this is that it only uses uh, position information to determine the correspondences. Another question to ask is how do we make this faster via subsampling? So uh, if we are only considering a certain set of points, especially ones that only had inliers, then it would make the matching process cheaper. Uh, we could also make it more accurate because we wouldn't uh, keep as many outliers that would need to be rejected in the second step. So one general idea is just to subsample uh, according to some given total number of points that we want to match. This is okay, um, but uh, it's perhaps better to use uniformity in a different type of feature space, such as normal space. Uh, so for example, uh, here uh, we see two scans of a basically a relatively flat piece of uh, tablet. This is a, a stone tablet from Rome. Uh, now matching just on positions in terms of the subsampling doesn't do a great job of, of producing an ultimate match. Whereas if we uh, sample in normal space, 
it's able to use the uh, those little crevices to help match the two scans together. Uh, the way that it samples in normal space is by thinking about taking the normals, plotting them on the surface of a sphere, and then picking only a subset of points which spans the distribution of those points with a relatively uniform distribution. So if uh, this, for example, was my distribution of normals on the sphere, I could try to pick points like this, uh, where I have now, you know, although there is a huge number of points over on the right, now I have a relatively balanced set of points and, and hopefully this will uh, produce better results in normal matching. We also have to perform outlier rejection and the common techniques for doing so include, for example, plane distance uh, thresholding, either with a fixed threshold, or we could also have a, an adaptive threshold that throws out the top X percent of, uh, of distances. So if I, have a, if I have matches that are too large, uh, let's say the top 50% or top 90% of matches, I will throw those away. The last difference between ICP algorithms is how to actually perform the single step optimization of trying to improve the matching uh, distance uh, between the, uh, the source and the target with the fixed correspondences already determined. So this course, this requires us to define the error function a bit more precisely so that we can develop good algorithms to try to uh, minimize it. It turns out that for the sum of squared point to point differences problem, uh, this is also known as the Procrustes problem. There is a very fast closed form solution to figuring out the optimal translation and rotation. The basic idea is this. We basically will find the translation to align the point sets together, and then we can use the uh, singular value decomposition in a, certain, a very specific way to align the primary axes of the point sets. Uh, this is very fast per step. It takes order and time, uh, and it only takes a single iteration to find the global optimum. Now, if we have a different type of error function, we, we may not be able to leverage this very fast uh, Procrustes problem solution with the SVD. Uh, so for example, uh, the sum squared point to plane uh, differences is actually uh, known to be a bit more robust in terms of, uh, of converging faster uh, to a global optimum uh, in terms of the number of overall ICP iterations. Uh, here we are looking that at the distance of a rotated point to the normal of the target point cloud. Now here we're taking the sum of squared distances, but it doesn't have such a clean uh, closed form solution. So we must use some numerical methods like Newton's method, and we'll have to deal with the rotation variable by a, some sort of encoding. So for example, we could encode it using Euler angles or quaternions, uh, but in any case, those rotation representations just get fed into the numerical method, they get converted into the R matrix, and then we evaluate the error function. Uh, the nice thing about this is that it tends to converge in fewer iterations of ICP. So if your matching step is especially uh, expensive, this can lead to faster convergence. However, if matching is very fast, oftentimes just using the fast point-to-point -point differences solution could be faster. Uh, so these tend to require a lot of empirical uh, investigation and also uh, custom implementations uh, with, uh, with optimized uh, code and also potentially optimized hardware. Now let's look at the extreme case of this. So the ICP works pretty well when there are a large number of inliers, not too many outliers. And it also requires some sort of good guess of the, uh, for your initial transform. Uh, currently people have been starting to look at using neural networks to give you the initial guess of, the, of ICP, uh, but we'll look at that into, uh, in, in, in future lectures um, because we don't have time to get into deep learning yet. So let's look at a more classical technique to deal with these, these problems with significant outliers. Um, the main uh, kind of general framework that people have been using to deal with problems with significant outliers is known as RANSAC. Um, here are some instances of some known 3D models and some very cluttered scenes. You can see that these models uh, are only appearing in some very small fraction of the scene, uh, but they're still able to recover fairly good fits using the ransack technique. It is, however, a fairly heavyweight approach that takes uh, quite a number of iterations to converge in complex problems. But let's talk about it. 
It's a very old algorithm, and it's actually a, a meta algorithm, which means that you must provide certain subroutines. RANSAC stands for Random Sample Consensus, and the general idea is this. We have some data set with outliers, and what we're going to do is repeatedly sample some subset that might be uh, a explanation of our, uh, of our phenomenon. That's known as a consensus set. We try to fit the model to that consensus set, and then we'll measure the score of how well that fit. After some number of iterations, we'll take the, uh, the consensus set that gave us the best fit, we'll try to refit the parameters and return that, uh, that ultimate result. As an illustration, let's try to find a plane that fits this data, which obviously doesn't seem to have a plane at all. So if we were to just do, for example, least squares fit, we'd come up with a line that looks like this. It certainly doesn't fit either of these two kind of corners well in this case. So with Ransack, we'll sample a small number of potential matches. In this case, we can just pick two, and then we can fit a line through these two points. And next I'll figure out how many inliers are determined by this line. Uh, here there are six points, which are fairly close, and so I'll give it a score of six. I might sample in the next round another a couple of points shown here in light blue, fit a line to those, and here I'll count that there are eight inliers. I may have then also sampled these points at some point. In this case, there are nine inliers. I'll just repeat this some number of times, and if I found that this was the best consensus set, the next thing I'll do uh, is I'll take that consensus set, I'll then refit to that set of inliers, and then I'll give you the line that has the best fit. Um, another option is that if I find a set of points that gives me a good consensus with a high enough score, I can just go ahead and terminate this uh, loop here and then refit to that consensus set step. So what I need for this to be fast is that I need to be able to sample matches quickly, I need to be able to fit the model fairly quickly, and determine these inliers fairly quickly. Um, otherwise, it'll be a very slow process, and um, this will take you know, thousands of iterations or, or tens of thousands in order to give me a good consensus set. Now, there are a few important parameters of RANSAC. The first one is n, the number of total iterations. Uh, m, is, which is the number of samples I draw from the sample set that I use to fit my test models. And then I'll have a fitting threshold for my inliers. There's a few things that we can say about these parameters. Uh, first of all, if we're trying to think about how likely it is to sample m inliers given a sample set, now this is going to decrease as the number of outliers increases. So the probability that s contains all inliers is going to be p sub i to the m, or p sub i is the inlier probability. Now, this is assuming that your inliers are, um, are, are independently uh, and identically distributed, uh, and also there don't need to be any kind of mutual compatibility constraints between these points that I sample. Uh, now, if I require these to be, for example, a certain distance apart or something like that, other kinds of compatibility constraints, the likelihood of sampling a good inlier set is even less likely. So this is sort of bad because as m increases, this is going to decrease. Um, now, if n increases, uh, the more likely it is that we'll find a set of inliers uh, given n iterations. So the probability that we have any inlier set found, it's going to be given by this expression here, which is going to converge towards 1 as n increases. So we'd like to increase n, decrease m, um, and also then choose tau appropriately. Now, how do we choose tau appropriately? Well, the larger this is, the more quote-unquote inliers we'll actually have, but we may also have false inliers. And so uh, we have to choose that depending on our threshold for what we believe is, is a reasonable noise threshold for our sensor data, and also the amount of, of tolerance we want to have for bad sample sets drawn. Um, in any case, it's used for pose estimation in images. So if you have a source image and a target image, you can oftentimes just sample corresponding points between uh, different feature points on the, on, on the source and target. Uh, the minimal sample size, if I was trying to find planes in uh, images, uh, I'd have to have four points sampled. Uh, if I had actually depth information, I could reduce this down to three. Uh, but the problem is then I'd have to enforce some sort of distance constraint between those points.
uh, because a rigid transform is not going to allow me to, to uh, shrink and stretch. Uh, scores that could be used could include uh, the sum of square distance in pixel space, like RGB space, or uh, we could also find the distance between features and the, and the closest match uh, for some set of features in my, um, in, in my source image. For point clouds, we can do a similar sort of thing. Uh, here, the minimal sample size is three points in the source and three points in the target. Um, the sampling should not be dependent, uh, independent because we have to figure out a rigid transform and so thereby uh, keeping uh, the distances between points mutually uh, equal both in the source sample and the target sample is really important. Uh, moreover, uh, it's important to bias your sampling towards potential matches either by using some sort of feature recognition uh, or, or plain uh, normal matching uh, to, uh, to help this uh, sample more likely to get a, a set of inliers. Um, and typically I'll use sum of square distances between the point and the closest match uh, as my ultimate score. So as a recap, we looked at three different pose estimation methods. Direct estimation, uh, which is useful when you have all inliers and you have perfect associations between, between the source and the target. Uh, ICP, in which you have many inliers, uh, but some imperfect association, and so you want to determine the correspondences dynamically. And then ransack, in which you have lots of uh, outliers, and it's using random sampling to try to generate a set that uh, produces inliers. Uh, for further reading about ICP, uh, here's a few more readings, and also here's ICP software if you're uh, interested in downloading some of those for your own projects. That's it for today. I'll see you next time.